Hello and welcome to another edition of the UK Law Weekly Podcast with me, your host, Marcus Cleaver. This week we're into 2018 and we'll be looking at the case of the Crown on the application of Haralambus and the Crown Court at St Albans. And the citation for this case is 2018 UKSC 1. This case concerns police warrants to search property. Normally, when such a warrant is issued, it contains all the relevant information that a person affected might need. But for Mr. Haralambus, this was not true as much of the information was redacted on the basis that it was in the public interest not to share certain details. By way of background, the application simply stated that the offence under investigation was conspiracy to commit fraud by false representation, and that there was an active inquiry into the handling of stolen pieces of artwork in which Haralambus was implicated as a suspect. There had been suspicious financial activity going on, but all we know of the warrant was that it was extremely generic in terms of what the police were looking for during their search. A search and seizure warrant was issued under Section 8 of the Police and Criminal Evidence Act 1984 by the Magistrates' Court, but without Haralambus present. This is known as ex parte proceedings. As previously mentioned, the warrant was redacted and an application for full disclosure was refused on the basis of something called public interest immunity. The next step for Haralambus was to begin a judicial review that would see the return of his property because the warrants, searches and seizures, etc. were unlawful. Before that review went ahead, the police agreed that the warrants should be quashed by way of a consent order. That should have been the end of things, but before the consent order was even signed, the police actually made a protective application under Section 59 of the Criminal Justice and Police Act 2001. This was allowed and so the police were able to retain the seized property. If you're getting a sense of deja vu then it will be no surprise to hear that Haralambus soon got started on another judicial review of this decision, but the divisional court found that under the statutory regime it was perfectly feasible for a judge to make these decisions in the light of material that could not be disclosed because of the public interest immunity. As the case made its way to the Supreme Court, The questions were about the statutory regime, but also more precisely, how the legislation held up at each rung on the court hierarchy. The justices decided that the best way to approach the case is from the bottom up, and so we start in the magistrate's court where both section 8 and section 15 of the Police and Criminal Evidence Act 1984 allow for an ex parte warrant application if that is what is in the public interest. Furthermore, this remains true even where the parts that cannot be disclosed are central to the legality of the warrant itself, as is the case here. This position may have surprised some, as since Al-Arawi in 2012, it has been established that unless there is express statutory provision, then closed procedures are banned. In his lead judgment, however, Lord Mance made it clear that this does not apply to ex parte proceedings, that have their basis in an act of parliament and establish what an expectation that on occasion it will be necessary for a magistrate to rely on information that cannot be disclosed more widely when they are making a decision. This gives us a starting point then by looking at the original warrant from the magistrate's court, but what about the protective application that derives from the Criminal Justice and Police Act 2001 and went before the Crown Court Looking closely at section 59.7, we can see that as long as the actual application takes place with both parties present, and there are sufficient public interest grounds, then the actual procedure for retaining property can take place with closed material. That is fine, but the actual question here is whether the Crown Court can rely on that evidence when making a decision, and to answer that we need to look at the actual procedure for a bit of context. In this particular situation, the judge has to put themselves in the position of a magistrate and work out if they should issue a brand new warrant to seize the property. We already know from what was stated above that as part of this, the magistrate would be able to rely on material that cannot be disclosed, and so the Supreme Court held that it makes sense that a judge in the Crown Court 
must be able to do the same. They decided this because there must have been an intention from Parliament that the Police and Criminal Evidence Act and the Criminal Justice and Police Act must work together as part of the same statutory regime. If this were not possible, then the whole process would not be able to operate effectively. In this regard, there was a useful comparison between this case and the 2014 decision in Bank Malat and Her Majesty's Treasury. All of this makes sense for the warrant and also the retention of seized property, but what about when Haralambus brought a judicial review under civil law before the High Court? This is very different, but remember that when looking at a judicial review, the question is whether a public authority acted correctly. If there was no possibility of a closed material procedure, the High Court would have no choice but to assume that the court did act correctly in issuing its orders. That is clearly not correct and would not allow proper scrutiny to be applied, and so there is again a useful comparison to be drawn with the situation that we just described in respect of the Crown Court and the Bank Malat case. In essence, how could a High Court quash an order when it is looking at a case in a fundamentally different way to how it was examined in the criminal courts. Logically, this is a legitimate reasoning, but from a legal perspective, there is an argument that the decision of the Supreme Court either doesn't hold true in its consistency, or at the very least rings hollow in its application. To show what I mean, it's worth remembering that the reason the principles taken from the Magistrates Court can be applied to the Crown Court is because they form a part of the same statutory regime. The issue is that the same is not true of the High Court in its capacity for judicial review. This is not mentioned or contemplated within the Act, and so the Justices are making a leap by transposing the closed material procedure from criminal law into civil law. Earlier on we talked about the case of Al-Rawi and how closed material procedures are not allowed without explicit statutory consent. But this decision seems to fly in the face of that. Arguably there is justification for this due to the very nature of judicial review, and this seems to be the argument presented by Lord Mance, but it does stray into rather uncertain territory where it is not clear if the Supreme Court is continuing parliamentary intention or forging its own path. Overall, the judgment is certainly one that is very helpful to the police in carrying out their work, and this is even directly cited as part of the judgment. While it is acknowledged that there do have to be the maximum possible rights for those subject to search warrants and property seizures, this is something that is accounted for already within the statutory regime. In the end, it is argued that this is not always possible, and if there is a legitimate public interest in non-disclosure, then, on balance, it is this that must take precedence. My own view is perhaps more sceptical of the use of police power, and the decision led me to thinking about the classic case of Entick and Carrington from 1765. Here, King's messengers broke into and seized property from Entick, before he successfully sued them for trespass. While the warrant system precludes any completely untrammeled right to property, the principle remains an important one. A principle perhaps best expressed by Lord Denning in Southam and Smount, 1964, whereby any given property, quote, may be frail, its roof may shake, the wind may blow through it, the storm may enter, the rain may enter, but the King of England cannot enter, all his force dares not cross the threshold." It is hard to imagine what the judges in those cases would have made of this decision in 2018. Perhaps they would have been accepting of the warrant, but the non-disclosure of material relevant to understanding the precise nature of the warrant would undoubtedly be a lot harder to stomach, even with the public interest immunity. Before we finish, there is one final point that can be made in relation to the decision to allow for a closed material procedure in a judicial review case before the High Court. But perhaps that is best expressed in this quote that is actually taken directly from Entick and Carrington. Quote, If it is law, it will be found in our books. 
if it is not to be found there, it is not law. End quote. Well, thank you very much for tuning in to another episode of the UK Law Weekly podcast. Thanks as ever to bensound.com who provide the theme music. Also, remember you can check out the YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash Marcus Cleaver. Um, and you can also rate and review the podcast on iTunes. That's always very much appreciated. I'll be back next week with the second case from 2018. Um, and I look forward to speaking to you then. Bye.